Welcome to this episode of Small Bike Stuff. This is my 450 second take, approximately. I feel like it is anyway. And uh, it's just me trying to explain a certain situation that's happened. And uh, I've got a couple of notes here, and it is all my personal opinion, but yeah, I'll explain it now. We'll just jump straight into it, so bear with me. Now, a lot of people have been affected by wide-reaching tech layoffs in the past year, and I myself am no different. Until December 2022, I was working for a New Zealand-founded company called Ubco. Upco came to be through two incredibly creative and deep thinking Kiwis who wanted to develop a two wheel drive electric utility bike. Their first creation was entered into an innovation competition at New Zealand's largest agricultural event, which they proceeded to win. On the back of the success and a wee while later, the brand Upco was created and a small team was collated to create the first production version of what became known as the 2x2. 2x2, two wheel drive. 2x2. Two two. A first release happened in 2017 and then a second generation came the following year and finally by 2019 a bike which was known as the generation 5 was brought to market and it had significant improvements over the original bike with robust build quality, power output increase, uh, increased range and a whole bunch more. Now I joined the company in 2021 after having been aware of them for a few years and I was quite skeptical of the product at first, but after watching the growth and seeing an incredible role consisting of my two favorite things, motorcycle knowledge and content creation, I jumped on board eager, excited, and keen to help with whatever I could to cement the legacy of a Kiwi creation. Joining the company, I, like many, had been hired on the premise of growth to expand the commercial fleets and with a bit of a push into other public markets. You see, despite being designed exclusively as an agricultural or farm bike, the 2x2 actually found a really comfortable home in the world of last mile delivery. The existing product was capable of 30 miles per hour or 50 kilometers per hour and it could be ridden in most countries on a normal car driving license. And it was suitable for short hops around the city. Its unique design allowed for large racks both front and rear, meaning that decent loads were feasible. Therefore, quite a good last mile delivery bike. At the time, Ubco was also developing a Suron-esque dirt bike. Uh, it was known as the FRX1 during development, and I actually got to ride the first version of it, and there had been press releases and videos about it and stuff like that, so that's not secret news or anything like that. But unfortunately, like many companies, the flow and effects of COVID lockdowns around the world and things of a similar nature meant that the development couldn't continue in the same manner that it had been. Now, this is a good time to explain that all of this is just my personal opinion, and within my role, I was never privy to any high-level secret information. And I've written a lot of Upco 2x2s, and there were videos of that on my channel. There are videos of that on my channel. So, uh, you know, I, I still do like the company, and I genuinely do wish great things for the company, as any sane human would and I do hope for their success as time goes on. However, in turn, that does lead me to the next point. After approximately 18 months within my role, and whilst I was actually overseas on a personal trip, the CEO stepped down, a flurry of emails were sent throughout the night, and a couple of meetings were scheduled for the following day. There was two different groups, and from there, it didn't take a rocket scientist to put together what was happening. And sure enough, one group stays, and one group would follow the New Zealand redundancy or layoff process. Now this happened for me and in early December I along with 40% of the global staff were let go and now this is one of the moments that I was incredibly thankful to be a Kiwi and to live in New Zealand. New Zealand employment law left us in a better position than our USA counterparts who lost their roles virtually on the spot. And if you want to know more about the New Zealand employment law process or the New Zealand redundancy or layoff process there's a lot of stuff on the internet about that. One quick google search should give you all you need to know. Now I was lucky enough not to be in a terrible position after this, I had other things I could focus on and as of now whilst filming this video I am employed full time and I'm continuing on with my life. But on the whole it raises an interesting question about the global tech scape and the global tech layoffs at present. Why do they keep happening? Are they preventable? Are companies just releasing one lot of staff and then rehiring another at a different rate? I mean that wasn't the case in my situation. But when you're looking in more detail with companies like Rivian, it does seem to be what's happening. It seems to be a reality for some. And this is my first time working for a startup company that was transitioning into a large entity. And a few things became apparent to me, which I've confirmed after conversations with a few others and similar style companies around the world. These things seem to be a bit of a trend in the tech industry. 
excessive meetings. It's not uncommon to have half a day tied up with meetings, several days a week, a lot of lost production time. And while some were actually really beneficial, many have excess people involved that have no relation to the topic at hand and often providing input without a full understanding of the situation. At a low level, it's actually not so bad. I didn't really suffer from that too much. But once you move up the ranks more, it's not uncommon to have multiple entire days every single week wiped out by meetings. Now, I'm not a Gary Vee evangelist, but that guy does speak some sense when he discusses meeting culture. Another thing is that when companies are small, getting progress on a project is actually quite easy. But as they grow, there's more people that are added into the decision process, and as you would expect, that sometimes drags out projects um, from a couple of weeks through to several months. There's also companies not understanding the target market or industry. Now, it's all good and well to have a smart, well-designed product, but at the end of the day, a company needs revenue eventually to survive, and shifting units is a big part of this. Some companies try to market themselves as tech-focused when really they're in the motorcycle industry, and making correct or incorrect distinctions at this point can set up a chain of great or terrible events to come to fruition as time goes on. And it seems to be a common trend that some organizations have executive decisions, high level decisions that will affect the whole company being made by people without direct industry experience. And this also ties into the excessive meeting culture as these decisions go back and forward between different entities, whereas a specialist of that industry or that specific thing within that industry would be able to understand, identify and execute a solution within a timely manner. For example, if I was running, uh, I don't know, a cake making company, I wouldn't be advising on the best, most popular cakes to focus on for profitability as I'm a motorcycle enthusiast that likes content creation. My role in such a company, if I ran it, would be to empower knowledgeable industry experts to do their thing and focus on the overall growth and strategy of the company. You would take advice from all angles and use that to make the best decisions moving forward. Now I'm certain there are other consistencies within companies that are going through these extensive restructuring processes, but I don't want this video to be 30 minutes long and I'm just one person with an opinion, so I have to call it somewhere. At the end of the day, I don't want this video to come across as a complaint because it's really not, and I did love my time working with Ubco, as I previously mentioned, and I deeply wish to see their success in the coming years. But I view this video as more of an observation into the tech industry as a whole. Obviously, there are things that I can say and that I can't say in a situation like this. And with the process being so fresh and having happened only a few months ago, maybe one day I'll be able to discuss in depth a more personal angle on the situation, but you'll have to subscribe and wait to see if that one ever happens. In summary, I, along with 40% of the staff at Ubco Bikes, we were let go at the end of 2022, and it was just before Christmas. It was a bit rough for some people, and it's a shame for all of the employees but I was lucky enough to land on my feet and I'm excited to see what 2023 brings for myself and the world and beyond. Have you been through this kind of experience before? Tell me below in the comments if you have. I'd love to read more, whether it was a big company or a small company or what happened in this situation for you. Try not to dox yourself, try not to give out too much detailed secret company info, but you know, just an overall view of your situation. If this has happened to you, it would be super interesting to read about. I promise the next video will be more two wheels focused in a proper, more exciting way, but I felt the need to share what happened as I had mentioned in my review that I did actually work for Ubco. Anyway, that's enough chat for one day and I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts if you did. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next time on Small Bike Stuff. Thank you so much for watching to this guy in his shed in New Zealand talking to a camera. We'll see you next time. Cheers.